Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bios and Bookmarks, powered by the NGC Bocas Litfest. I'm Shivani Ramlochan, Bios and Bookmarks Project Manager. And I can hardly believe we are past the midway point of this season, which is season six. I am delighted, though, to be here with Zakia McKenzie, who is no stranger to the Bocas Litfest family. Zakia, welcome to Bios and Bookmarks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Sakia has been here over the years in her capacity as a researcher and academic with the Caribbean Literary Heritage Project. But today she is donning a different hat and is here as a writer. And I am especially excited to speak with her in this capacity. Today we'll be talking about her pamphlet, which is also her debut. It's called Testimonies on the History of Jamaica, Volume 1, or A General Survey of Things that Have Been Said About the Ancient and Modern State of That Island. It is an impressive title, and with the length of what seems like a very small book, you will find that the contents are just as impressive. Sakia is doing nothing less than taking on history, how it is chronicled and has been archived, and asking whose stories are told in the process. Let me tell you a bit more about her before I invite her to read. Zakia McKenzie is a PhD candidate with the Leverhulm Trust supported Caribbean, Caribbean Literary Heritage Project at the University of Exeter, where she's researching Black British journalism in the post-war period. She's a writer and storyteller and was a 2019 Writer in Residence for Forestry England during its centenary year. In Bristol, she was 2017 Black and Green Ambassador and is a volunteer at the Ujima Community Radio Station. Zakia regularly leads nature, art and writing workshops, including one on Caribbean storytelling for primary schools. Her work has featured the Cabo Institute for the Environment at the University of Bristol, the Institute for Modern Languages Research at the University of London, the Hepworth Wakefield Gallery, the Free Word Centre at Cheltenham Liter Literature Festival, on BBC's Woman's Hour, Farming Today and Inside Out West. She has written for Smallwoods Magazine, The Willow Herb Review and BBC Wildlife Magazine. Sakia, without further ado, I'd love to invite you to share your first reading from your pamphlet, please. Thank you so much. So I am going to read from the second part, which is a character called Wanda Shiva. Now, Wanda Shiva is a fictional character based on a real person called Wanda Serras. And we have two, uh, well, in British history books, there are two people listed as the first Maroons ever. So in history, we have the first two Maroons listed by name, actually one, the one, one de Bolas is the one that we know first. Um, and there's a mountain and a river in Jamaica named after him. And we also have one de Serras is the other one that we don't know as much about. And so this testimony is given by one de Sheba, who is a character based upon one de Serras. And in the story that we have written is that uh, they were friends, they were compadres at one point. Something happened and one de Bolas uh, supported the British. Juan de Serras kept his allegiance to the Spanish in a way. Um, and it is said that one of them killed the other one. And so this is Juan de Serras or Juan de Sheba in my story uh, talking about when they fell out. <clears throat> si, si, si. El Grio Anansi. Todos en la casa ahora. I know you want to hear if Juan de, Juan de Sheba murder Juan de Bola. Who must answer for the death of first revolutionary of Jamaica? Who is to blame? You tell me, for this is not my trial. But how can any man live under those circumstances? It matter who kill him if the result is he die a traitor anyway. Me not calling Bola traitor. This is not my dying trial. But see for yourself if Bola could keep on living. When we flee from the capital city of Santiago de la Vega, Juan de Bola and Juan de Shiva set up two different bases. We call our settlement Palenque or Pelinco with our group of Maroons, Los Pueblos. 
Bola go into the mountains above Guanaboa Vale, and me go towards Varmahali, and that is why they call us Varmahali or Karmahali Maroons. From then, we live peaceful between us, Bola and Sheba, Ibeji, brother. We have one mission, stay free, la libertad, never slave for Spaniards again and never begin slaving for British men. We elect our officials, even me and Bola elected in our palinko. We don't give one man ultimate rule. Only one ruler we know is the reina Jamaica rule. Parmahali and Guanaboa live good in the hills. When we leave the slave scene, we know that we must fight to make our own rules. So Bola attack Los Britannicos, so Sheba attack Los Britannicos. We take weapons, food, clothes, and other supplies, and we free any slave we find. We kill all British, but we don't kill all the Spaniards because we enter into discussion with some of them. The Palenque of Bola have more than 150 people in it and they plant more than 200, of 200 acres to feed everybody. Even me have to admit, it is very impressive when me take Bakbush to visit me hermano for military reconnaissance. Bola loyal to his people and he makes sure everybody know how to feed themselves and everybody know how to fight. And Bola allow them to love each other too. Bola give room for all love, for that is because the white man takes so much love away from us that Bola figured the only way to give it back is to let it run free. One thing with my airman of Bola, he treats everybody nice. He listens to every umber story, and me tell him it will cause us to become enemy one day because he give all riffraff a chance to talk. Our Mahali Maroons don't play those games. We just cut neck. We don't run risk in the land of Jamaica. We neutralize it. Bola becomes so respected that white man from England write letter to him, write letter to each other about him. So respected or so feared was he. They start to hunt Bola because they know he terrorized them from near their plane close by Santiago de la Vega. One day, un dia del diablo, one devilish day, los Britannicos catch on to where Bola live. It was two conniving maroons that sell out Bola. They stray too far and Los Britannicos convinced them to show them Bola. No, 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 no. Don't blame these men, don't blame them. For Bola himself, no object to white man at his homestead. Bola weakness is that he not irate like me. He lets these men come in peace. Bola lets Los Britannicos talk, Karma Hali Maroons. Bola lets Los Britannicos talk. Karma Hali Maroons, no white man only bring trouble for black man and black woman. So, they come to Jamaica to steal, to kill, to infect, and to take life from every place that have beauty. We don't know how a man so wicked, pero things Spanish, Spaniards and English do in Jamaica, you cry blood and your ears burn with hellfire to hear it. No pretend like you don't know what Los, Blan Los Blancos do to us. No act like you don't know why even today we not find common ground. This council would not be here today if peace was already found between white people and Jamakaru, our land leader. Me never understand it. Why, why me airman not go from first revolutionary of Jamaica to first maroon traitor of El Pueblo. But all you hear, you never know how a man sleep for all sleep is mark of death when Los Britannicos are around. Man who don't sleep is already living doppy, dead man walking. He's scared for his life and for the life of everybody he loves. He's scared to sleep, for it may mean he no see or feel love again if he die there. If you have love, it's better not to sleep. Otherwise, it's better not to love, not to feel good, not to enjoy life. Porque somebody already control your life. Europe give Jamaica everything bad and take everything good. They bring so much stink to Jamaica, it takes centuries to clear the stench, cut and clear. Pero still, nothing give answer to how one of Jamaica's brightest sons, one day bola turn on us. Pero how to choose the lesser evils but either one mean death. If one is to kill, the other is to murder. So it don't matter what a man have to choose. The hermano Wandebola chose British, and for that he did die. 
Ibeji, why? Thank you. Thank you so much for that reading, Zakio. It strikes me that a pamphlet like this is both extraordinarily timely and also astonishing that it had not been published before. Let me mm -hmm. talk about the life of this publication, what made it mm -hmm. necessary, and why it came to you in the time that it did. Oh, good. You know, it's a good question. I think, well, Rough Trade Books who publish it approach me and I... Um, about a story, you know, doing something because they know I kind of write about the environment and they had this um, series with the Garden Museum. So it's Rough Trade Books and the Garden Museum, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I think they wanted an idea about nature from a perspective such as this. And it was just the perfect point because I had just learned the story of Catherine's Peak in Jamaica. So Catherine's Peak is the highest uh, point in the parish of St. Andrew. And I was interested in why it was called Catherine's Peak. Well, I found out that Catherine was, um, you know, a white woman who climbed, who is said to be the first woman to climb the peak. Now, as I said in the pamphlet, okay, she's not the first. No, you cannot tell me she's the first woman to climb the peak. What I mean is she's probably the first white woman, maybe not Spanish, Spaniard woman. So maybe she's the first British woman recorded to have climbed the peak. And it was named after her. So at the time, I just thought, this is, you know, this is just, it's just jokes to me. It started when I was writing it. It was just like, this is just a ridiculous story that has perpetuated for so long that it clearly cannot be true because even Catherine herself probably had some women who, slave women maybe, you know, enslaved women who climbed up there with her. So I thought, you know, this is just, it's just foolishness. And so when they approached me, I was like, okay, I, I have the idea. So it started off as just, what is the last testimony from Tansy? Um, just about Catherine's Peak. But then when I was looking for sources about Catherine's Peak, this is when I found the book that is called The History of Jamaica, which my title is kind of, um, you know, based off of. And so within the history of Jamaica, that book, which by the way, is written by Catherine's brother. So at the same time, you know, he is the one who wrote that his sister is the first one to climb the peak. Um, there were all these other stories that, again, were just ridiculous. Um, but also, the, it's a weird book because it has a lot of facts, historical facts and things about the environment, naming of the plants, the, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the things that were being imported, what they were exporting, which countries they were coming from. But it is entirely racist and it's just racist, just, just as a fact, just as a fact in how, um, you know, uh, black people and also the indigenous people of Jamaica are spoken about. So I thought it's a so it's a hard book to read because I want to read it for the historical fact, but then it's, there's some parts that I just cannot gloss over like that. So trust me, I light enough candle, I burn enough fire, I pour enough rum to clean out my yard and to tell my ancestors, sorry for bringing this book into here. And, and, and it haunted me. It's a haunting book. Yeah. I mean, you're raising something that was written generations and generations ago but the problem you're describing now we could very easily pick it up and ascribe it to a lot of what is called nature writing in England today mm -hmm. which by your very presence in that scene as one of the most prominent emerging writers of nature in mm -hmm. in the UK I mean you must be incredibly mindful of that fact this is what the pamphlet is doing and also what your broader work is speaking to how did people reclaim parts of their history that have always belonged to them that have been so commodified yeah. and fetishized by the white empirical gaze? And, and the pamphlet is doing that very distinctly through three different strains of narrative voices. And I want to know, you must have encountered so many voices coming at you mm -hmm. in the archives. How to choose this set of three uh, of Isolo, yeah, out of the two ones, Wandes, and of Tansy, what made their stories feel more imperative and coming mm -hmm. to the fore? So, Tansy was the easy one because just thinking about women, thinking about myself, my grandmother, who's still you know 90 odd, still living country. Um, so it was so that was Tansy was the easiest one to tell the story with, I think, as a as a 
a book and it was the most painful one to to, to write as well and in a way that's why she's the the kind of cantankar one in a way because she's she's rebelling against that all of that and then um one day seraph in fact choosing to write one day sheba and not one day bola one day bola who is the more the more well-known one right the one who we have things named after in jamaica and we learn about him a little bit in school i did not know about one day seraph before is because of the complicated story of the maroon and and i mean and the questions that we don't ask right and in in a way you know we have a new maroon chief in jamaica who's high profile this was written way before then so in a way it's um and what's happening i think with that whole situation uh it is causing people to ask those questions now right and so i think that one was a testy one that i didn't think i could jump into too much um because it's a community that still exists now and you know so there are questions that i think they probably have to grapple with um and so i chose to, the, the character who we don't know that much about who we don't hear that much about and try to give him a, a, a story um a voice behind it as well but to raise that that question about did maroon people in jamaica return enslaved people to the plantation and possibly why so even though in the story one day Sheba is saying, you know, maybe I killed him, maybe I didn't, didn't he also says, that what other choice did, did, did my brother one day have? He, he, anyway, it was death for him. So I think it was about the complicated situation. Now, a character who is not there is an indigenous character, a Taino person from Jamaica. That's a big, uh, and again, that was because I didn't think I had the knowledge base to write from that position, right? And so... Volume two, volume three, that voice will come through, I think, but I needed, I felt I didn't have enough, uh, be, you know, I didn't research enough, didn't know enough to kind of write it authentically. And the first character in the test, who gives testimony, who is like a, a time-shifting demigod, who is almost like genderless, we don't know who, which one of the, uh, we don't know if it's one person or if there are actually three people in three, you know, bodies in one kind of entity. Um, I think that needed to happen again to one say that we are imagining a world for ourselves and imagining what people who lived through that time, not people because again, this is a being who lived through that time might have said, and why is it that we would take this voice as an authority, right? You have a, an enslaved woman who's dead. Well, she says she's a duppy. She prefer being dead as a duppy anyway. Don't call her a slave. You have a maroon but then, you know, I think I needed the Isolo voice to be the kind of authority to, to actually uh, push back on the writings of Edward Long or the very official writings that came through Isolo. Um, I imagine this character as, you know, possibly in a suit or something like a very kind of stoic. And, and that's how I imagine this character uh, or the, the three of them kind of very stoic and forthright in, in what they say and what they believe. So I think I needed a kind of authoritative character as well to challenge the story and I saw it but that's not how it did actually go um you know all the things that were written it, the process of putting a book like testimonies together must be challenging on on multiple fronts because in much of your practice as an academic and a writer and interpreter of creative events through the lens of, of academic nonfiction. Yeah. Your discipline and your scholarship has led you to, to treat with these creative narratives in one way. And now you're in the position of being the creative voice, of bringing all of your, your industry to bear on telling a story in this way. And with that must come the idea of a responsibility and you've just spoken about it, of speaking yeah. for, of speaking for the voices in Jamaica's history, which is a part of the history which you explain is not very profoundly or extensively or exhaustively written about. Like you're mm -hmm. reaching into a history that is deprived of a lot of the archive. The archive is, is missing or illegible yeah. or was not certainly not doc documented by black and brown people. Exactly. Though it might have been recorded by voices of empire. How did you feel your previous training as a scholar come to bear on your creative work in this way? Do you think it it is indistinguishable, that difference of what lies in the text? Or did you feel space for a new creative Zakianist to emerge <laughs> from this project? Um, yeah, definitely, because it's the first time I've written 
fiction. Well, first time I've ever, you know, I, write, I might be right those things. I don't share them. So it's the first time I've kind of written fiction and delved into historical fiction in this way, you know, um, with a few, this the pamphlet and a few other pieces. Uh, but again, it, it is kind of coming out of my academic work and being in the archives and seeing how things run and knowing how the universities run and knowing how things get omitted, right? So I think, you know, I've, I've tried to be careful and not say I'm, it's lost voices. We weren't, we, just, we weren't listening. You know, the, the mm -hmm. stuff was there, but it just hasn't been pulled out. So I think it's me knowing how rich the archives are for what is already there and seeing what's missing from it because, as you say, it wasn't recorded by Black and Brown people. It wasn't recorded by Indigenous people in the Caribbean. And thinking, all right, make we, make we make a story for them, make we make up a scenario so that um, while it's fiction, it's so that other people who are reading and trying to access the archive can have, if not a companion to the official archive, even a different source of archiving, right? And so I see it as there's no way we're going to know those stories now at this point. We're not going to know them. We have to imagine them. We have to imagine them in, in a way that, that puts us in a, in a uh, at the end of it, we feel positive about the story, right? We, we don't want this history that only starts at slavery and then ends with the slaves being freed and then, oh, 1962, independence, right? We, we, we need the kind of, uh, we, need, we, need, we need a texture in there to, to give more life to it. So I think one of the reasons I wrote it is because you just see that a lot of us hate ourselves. We, we hate ourselves, right? We do, we do not like ourselves. And it's because of what many of the stories that we've been told and so maybe if I write some new story and tell some new perspectives on it, then possibly maybe I can, you know, give somebody something to be proud of. One less reason to not like themselves as a Black person or as an Indian person or as an Indigenous person in the Caribbean. That is beautiful. And in as much as you're reaching far back into history that is both pre-recorded and badly recorded and under-recorded, mm -hmm. what you're also doing is addressing concerns of the human heart and that are universal. I, I found this to be strikingly the case with Juan de Bolas and, and Juan de Serras, who, in whom you're really unpacking the concept of marunage and, and saying before we came to understand the term that is maroon, there were the cimarrones and, yes. and what of that ancestry and that legacy, which is also yes. part of what has been underwritten. And within the story, of these two men who, who find themselves caught up in the pull of forces that are much more powerful uh, and, and more funded and more mercenary mm -hmm. than they are. You're asking this essential question of, of what betrayal is. What does it mean when one brother betrays another? So, so talk to me about writing very human everyday concerns mm -hmm. into the lives of these people and the effect that had on you as the writer. Yeah, yeah, and I, that, that was it. You know, I was thinking, again, we flattened slaves, maroons, you know, and we have the discussions about these terms, do we say enslaved people, do we say slaves? We have these discussions, but actually thinking about a wider life, what was the experience for these people? What did they grapple with again? As you say, so I included this Spanish Jamaican character because one, this is not a thing that we, we speak about much, you know, going to the Jamaican education system. We don't learn that part of our colonial history much. So I thought, okay, let's try and learn it. Let's try and find some of the info for it. Um, but at the same time, I thought it, that must have been so hard because everything written says that Wanda Bola, Wanda Shiva, Wanda Seras killed Wanda Bola. Every recording says that he was killed by a maroon and possibly the other famous one. And I think that must be, you know, that, that man Duffy must be so happy because he loved him. They loved each other. They worked together before. Before the British invaded, they were, they were fine. Right? Before the British invaded and, and mashed up the Spaniards' things, they were fine. It's when the Spaniards fled, when the Molas, when the Serras fled into the mountains, they were fine in the beginning until they had to choose allegiances. And I think... How, you manage, how do you manage that, right? And that's why this character says over and over, like, how, he couldn't, what could he do? What could he do? He, if he never turned on us, he was going to die. Either way, it was death. So I think, and I just, and because it's a question that me and my friend, you know, in reading some of the history kind of asked, like, wait, you know, because we, we learned that, like, 
the, the maroon, marooned people were bringing people back to plantations. So not even not that is not even the part of the story that I pick up, right? Because I think that one is even harder to tackle. I tackle the kind of interpersonal one that um that I think everybody can feel, you know, that's the one where everybody can possibly feel about love and kinship and, and friends even. Um and respect because he has Wanda Sheba has great respect for him, has absolute respect for him to the utmost and and possibly even says he was a better leader than me. You know, he he talks about the farms, he talks about all the things that the British recorded this, right? Wanda Sheba is telling us about it. Um, he's saying he allowed people to love each other. There's so much love there. So he actually, you know, I think, and this is possibly why he has to give the testimony because he himself is tormented. He's tormented. He does. He's guilty, but he knows that that was possibly his only choice to live. But in the end, it never saved Jamaica. Jamaica still went to the British, right? So he still was hunted by Henry Morgan over and over and over um, in the in the 1700s. So um, again, it just I think it was talking about the complexities of what that time must have been like to live through. Not just this idea that these were slaves, lowly slaves that had no nothing to do but uh, work for the slave masters, which is which is true. You see, it's true in a way, but. We know that even though uh, the wretched of the earth, poor people, you know, people that we don't consider uh, to to be at the top of society, have lives and have texture, and in fact, prob probably because of the lack of resources, find the best things to add to our world that we then appropriate. So, I think this was a question of how are we seeing and how are we how are we representing these people and their lives and what they had to grapple with, good and bad good and bad because we have to see everything and, and that was also a part of writing the pamphlet to say um because I didn't want it to be like a whole nice nice story right we had to be real about it I think I had to be kind of very real about it and so I included a lot of those what would be seen as uh hurtful harmful interpersonal relationships to say look they're, they're just like us they were just like us just hundreds of years ago you know <laughs> I mean that that universality is at the heart of the the experience, and I mean, as as you know, and as our viewers know, this season on bios and bookmarks, we've been discussing our relationship as Caribbean people to the natural world, to our regional ecology, and and how invested we are as creative people in in maintaining and preserving it. And I think this consideration is also at the heart of your pamphlet because one of the true victims if we want to use that word, of all of this historical overwriting is the land itself. And we see yes. Catherine doesn't have a choice in, in being named after mm -hmm. the wrong woman and and claimed and conquested in a certain way. And this mm -hmm. is as true for many of the contemporary place names in Jamaica as it is for Trinidad or yep. Guyana or any part of our Caribbean experience. And, and I think your pamphlet is showing the effects of that on the land. And if it affects the land, it must affect the psyche of all our generations to come. Yes, definitely. And, and that's why we have the natural environment being personified. So this, uh, the testimonies are being given in a council of Caribbean queens, um, not in our world, in a, another world. And in this world, the, sorry, that's what's on COVID. So, yeah. um, and so in this council, the, the, the queen who represents Jam Jamaica is called Jamakaru. That's just a linguistic thing that I like. It's a cactus. A, a Jamakaru is a, a cactus. It doesn't even actually grow in Jamaica, but there is the same linguistic link of the indigenous people and the Jama in both places, right? So I thought that's a good way to bring it through. And it is, you know, in the beginning, the kind of convener of the session says our whole world is gilded over right now because Jamakaru can't manage the land who she represents, so the, the uh, you know, queen represented by this cactus, who represents Jamaica, Queen Jamakaru, she can't manage. So everything is just gone, it's gilded over until we work it out. And in the same way, in naming some of the islands, you know, the uh, the raging warrior of culture to represent Guyana. Um, I think I, I speak about Old World Macaque the Monkey to represent Barbados and the Salt Ponds to represent uh, St. Kitts, is it, where the Salt Ponds is? So it's, again, saying that the, the environment is our main character in it. In fact, they are the ones that we have to give our testimony to. 
these are the people, these are the ones who we have to answer to, and they are the ones who will grant us either um, uh, the destruction that we expect to happen with the ecological crisis that we're in in the world now, or they will tell us how to possibly survive. And it, it's definitely about the land, a hundred percent. And in the the range of your writing as it exists, as you exist as a person of the Caribbean, living and working and existing in, in the United Kingdom, all of your work, both academic and non, seems to speak to this very directly. I'm thinking particularly of your 2019 writer in residenceship with, mm-hmm. with Forestry England and the work that you did in the Forest of Dean, which... Yeah. Not for nothing, is also one of England's forests that is so closely associated with myth and mm-hmm. and storytelling in a way that had been almost completely white. And and the work that you produced as part of this residency really confronted and challenged that by saying, I am not the first black person to exist in these woods. And then that that is a story that is being denied to all of us not just me or people who look like me. So if we could talk a bit about your time and and also significantly in the centenary year mm-hmm. of, of that establishment and the work that you felt emerging from that project and mm-hmm. what it means to be a Black woman writer of nature in England right now. Yeah, so the, what I produced in the end was nothing like I said I would. You know, I definitely said, oh, they write something nice poem and stuff. But actually, once it, what I got there and grappled with it, it was like, I need to possibly do a bit more thinking, you know, reflection on it. So there were some things that were clear. I went into nearly every forest with a host, right? I was not there on my own. It, it's a very different experience when I just rock up with my friends and, or my family. I just go somewhere. So these things were clear. When I was hosted, I had a very different experience. Um, possibly a lot of these places I wouldn't go by myself. It just would be too awkward. And so I think for me, I had to write about these things in a way because I also met people who lived there. So me saying, I'm not going to go there on my own. But then I met you know, a young woman who lived in the forest of Dean all her life, black woman, and dealt with all of the rubbish, but said like, this is my place. I'm not going. I don't want to live in Bristol. I don't want to go to town. I'm staying here. Right. And so it became, um, I suppose I was interested in more of these stories because I get, we don't hear them. And I understand that I was in a position of responsibility. And because, and I'm very strong on the fact that because I grew up in the Caribbean, where it's a lot of people look like me in all of the positions, right? Good and bad from the the, the courthouse to the jailhouse, it's all people who possibly look like me, you know? And so for me, there was this, uh, when I come to England, I'm just like, bump to know, like, you guys don't know that you can do this, you know, you don't know you can do that, but they don't because the society has kept them down and said you cannot do it. So in a way, when I applied to the Forestry Commission, it was also a weird thing, but it's just because I come with this Caribbean brashness that I could do anything because I'm seen everybody like me do it um and the forest of dean was one that really caught my heart it, it really reminded me of portland in it's country people and it just made me realize that country people rural life is so similar all over the world right um forest of dean and it has this very special status as the only two forests in england that have it because it was something like a king's forest the king's wood it was an official forest of the king so they're absolutely uh strange rules in it like people you can have a personal mine you know you can mine in the backyard if you were born in a certain area so it's local and as you said these stories are so local and you don't know them until you go there and meet the people and so the forest that stood out to me the most are the ones where the people were not the pretty pretty forest it was just a nature walk it was really the ones where I met people who could tell me about and tell me the local names right Forest of the once you say forest of the the people who live there know you don't live there, right? Because to them it's just the forest, right? Or the dean. So it's just these kind of very local things which reminded me of Portland, of of, of Swift River, where my mother born, where my grandmother still is, and that life that you only know once you get there and get into it. And um they're not not all of the forests were like that, but the forest of Dean was. And I had hosts as well. And big up to reading the forest project at the University of Gloucestershire because they hosted me. Um, 
introduced me to a lot of the stories that have come into my work, particularly the story of the black boy of Little Dean Hall or the slave boy of Little Dean Hall, which again, we don't hear about the stories of people from the Caribbean who were in England, right? Enslaved people. This happens to be a very true story of a brother and sister, at least we don't know if they were more siblings, who were brought from the island of Nevis to work in the forest of Dean, just, o- just over the foot, right? In the 1700s. I would not call them slaves, you know, there were no slaves on English soil, there were servants, there were this, there were that, but so when I come across these stories, I'm like, let's tell the truth, right? Let's, mm-hmm. let's be honest. Not because them they found British soil. It's, they were slaves in the Caribbean. You brought them here to live the same life, right? And let's talk about it, though, because they are marked in that forest. They are marked in the forest. And also, we have many more people who are marked in the forest now in very different ways. Um, uh, one of the, the people who I've worked with in that forest uh, more recently is this young woman called Caddy Gay. And Caddy is like, Caddy gets so much racism for her work in the forest just because she kept a, a Black Lives Matter protest mm-hmm. um, after George, George Floyd's murder last year. And since then, she got so much backlash. And when you see Caddy, Caddy, a hot girl, she's young, she's cute. Like, that's not supposed to be her life. She's supposed to be living her life. She's she in uni. Caddy's supposed to be enjoying her life, not out there talking to old pe- you know, older people who are pushing back constantly at a silent protest. And so, you know, we understand, hey, hey, no, right? Because maybe maybe with my Caribbean breakfast, I'm ready to stand in front and say, actually, no, you're not going to deal with them like that. You're not going to deal with these Black people in Britain like that. Let, let me come and write something for them. So maybe you would listen to them. And in some ways it works. Some ways it don't work, of course. But some people uh, have heard the stories and, and found some. I mean, two, two really important pieces of writing come to mind that I think are directly in conversation with what you're doing. One of them is, of course, Thinking with Trees, Jason mm-hmm. Allen Paisan's debut collection mm-hmm. of poems. And we had Jason and his yes. book on this season of Bios and Bookmarks because he is addressing this very real question of how do I exist in my Black body, in my Black self, mm-hmm. taking a walk through the woods. And it is such a hostile prospect to even do that. And the other is Corinne Fowler's Green Unpleasant Land, which mm-hmm. is... Yes which is critically unpacking what it means to be descendants of property owning, all these mm-hmm. grand and stately manors and, and mm-hmm. houses and, and plantation fueled architectures. What is their blood legacy? Mm-hmm. And, and the response to that particular book written and, and researched by a white scholar yeah. has been extremely chilling in, in the level of vitriol yes. and, and actual threats against Fowler's person. And I think I think of your work and Jason's work and how much yeah. more violent that kind of reprisal is or mm-hmm. would be to, to black and brown bodies existing in England. Because there's also something really profoundly racist that you're both writing against yeah. and, and the confrontation of that and the re- repercussions of confronting that are very real. Mm-hmm. And you're also yeah. doing that work in this pamphlet. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, both works are absolutely great works. And in exactly what you said, no, when I teach writing workshop, Jason's poems are there. I teach those poems, especially the ones, uh, essays on dog walking, mm-hmm. right? I love that poetry because it's exactly what we grapple with on a daily basis that isn't discussed. Same with Corinne's book. And I mean, that put the fear of God in my heart, you know, and in a way I was very glad I went historical fiction because I cannot, um, I can't deal with that, you know, and I think uh, uh, maybe that couple to write it as fiction um, and not, not as, as fact, but I, I, I just didn't even understand how it, because it's, she's just talking about facts, right? She's just writing um, or, or rewriting the fact in, on, on the, a different thesis, you know, it's, it's all facts, but I suppose it's the uh, um, it's it's England does not want to let go of the glory days. I can kind of say that now that I'm here for a long time. Like the first year I came here, I couldn't understand why everything was about the war. Everything was about war. Like it will not let go in a way. Right? It still has mm-hmm. all this kind of, and there's a, a bunch of hypocrisy there because. Uh, it, it's still profit from it, or it's still, or up until actually 2015 was paying 
right? Uh, 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 slave owners who left, who lost in in their 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 property during abolition in Jamaica in the in the British Caribbean. So I think it's it's a very strange situation for me because you expect a white woman writing historical facts would be uh, see okay, you know, or, or accepted in a way or seen like all right, yeah, it's okay, we hear you, but be quiet. But actually, it's, it's so hateful towards her and. It's scary, and it definitely made me glad that this was written as historical fiction at the time, because I could have written it with my academic voice or my journalistic voice as well. Because, like I said, it's it's, it's just a literature review of a different book of, of some other books, you know. It's just a literature review in a way, um, and so it's it's scary. And I would hope that you know it, it stops. It stops. I I'm with you. 100%. As well as the people who are tuning in to listen, we have a couple of lovely comments. One from Khadija Ibrahim, who says, lovely wow. reading. Thanks, Akia, for sharing this story. And also from Ayana Lloyd Banwu, who says, yes. loving this conversation. And Thank so you, it's a reminder Thank of the, the powerful community that we create as as writers and, and readers, not just mm -hmm. writers who nice readers as well. who yeah. recognize the imperative of speaking back to a certain kind of recorded history. And there's there's so much more I want to ask you also about Tanzi and Izolo, but mm -hmm. I think before I do that, I would like to invite you to do your second reading for us, please. Okay, and I'm going to read from everybody's favorite, who is Miss Tanzi. Um, and so Miss Clancy is the woman who actually traveled with Catherine Long, Catherine Moore. She was born Long. She married Moore. And this is her talking about those travels with this family, the Long family. So remember, Catherine's, uh, Catherine's brother is Edward Long, who, who, who wrote the history of Jamaica, which kind of is to this day the cornerstone of what we know about Jamaican history. And the other thing I want to point out, too, is that Catherine married um, Henry Moore, so Moore, Maroon Town was orig originally called, I mean, Moore Town, so a place that's now called Moore Town, where we know that Maroons live, was originally called Maroon Town or Nanny Town, one of the two. And um, so Catherine's name is marked on Catherine's Peak on all of the places in Jamaica that are called Long, so Longville, Longwood, all of the Long places that, you know, the place that her family, the Longs had plantations and also to her husband, uh, Moore, who, whose name is now uh, ironically, where Maroons live. So Tansy says, Me travel all over Jamaica with the long, and then with Catherine Moore. They keep me close, cause me quiet, and them think me ignorant, but me just can't bother argue with them. For one day, me make up my mind that if me get one more beating, me I go kill one of them. From that day, me stop argue, and just do as me told. All over Jamaica, me go carrying bag and pan, walking miles and miles for them to write book and draw a picture of plant and pretend to love Jamakaru family. Me was there, you know. Me was there when the one them called Hans Sloan visit Jamaica and collect all the plants and carry back to Queen Anne in England. Him, Dr. Barham, Dr. Patrick Brown, they send most of the things from the Americas that they really and truly become addicted to. They draw and write description of every plant and animal and try to claim what Jamakaru lay out for themselves. Me was there when him collect all of them and the whole of it was there before we, so they don't really know what they even do the collecting for. By time all of them find by time by the time all of them finally get them wish, England created a botanical garden in 1779 at Bath in St. Thomas in the Vale, where they generally just call it the walk because all the white people visit the parish and walk around saying, ah, and oh, at all the things that grow there. When the Moors travel, and they travel a lot for Henry become governor of Jamaica, me get to see all about what's happening in different parish. In St. Andrew by Mona Estate, there is a market that me love to visit to see some of the new food that they bring into Jamaica. Slaves not get to know this food, you know, for they bring it in for the white people to eat. But some of them grow here anyway, and me get to learn about the other variety from other Caribbean country or from North America where they also have good fruits. The Hope River freshen up this part of the island. 
on the market at the bottom of the river near Papin Plantation. Right there, so me get to see French bean, celery, radish, lettuce, cucumber, strawberry, melon, mulberry, some strange apple, fig, and all kind of peas. Some of the fruit grow here in Clarendon, you know, like the Queen's tree at Old Woman's Savannah. Or you could even get the fruit that they call nectarine at the Vale at Luida. But enough of it grow in Ligony Mountain in St. Andrew, where the air is cool and the soil is ready. So it tastes better there. But they don't make we plant it, you know. No, no, they don't plant it to sell it like sugar. They only bring it because some wife complained that she's going back to England at once if she don't get something for her figgy pudding. Me, no, because me was right there with them. Thank you for that. I I think there are clear reasons why why this narrative wins a place automatically in everyone's heart. To who I've spoken to, who who I've seen oh, interacting with the pamphlet, it's very hard not to root for Tansy. And why would you want to? I mean, from mm -hmm. from the beginning, she establishes herself as a person who is uncowed, despite the brutality that we know that she's seen. Yeah. And I I think with her. With her testimony, what you are doing is bringing into sharp relief the issue of who gets to be a land-loving naturalist. I mean, Tansy yes. is pointing out the fact that she is having to traipse behind and fetch and carry for these white people who own her, and they can make drawings of plants and trees and and flora and fauna and inscribe themselves in the process as what we mm -hmm. were talking about at the beginning of our conversation as those who represent Jamaica's topography and its natural mm -hmm. landscape for what it is. These are the makers of maps, yes. the surveyors, the cartographers, and this is still the inheritance and the legacy mm -hmm. that you learned in school, that the yes. generations of Jamaican children study, yes. referencing these maps and this history. And would it be fair to say that, that it is with Tansy that you feel the closest affinity? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Tansy is the one that is, is, is speaking not just to the British, whereas the other characters might be speaking British Spaniard. Uh, Isolo speaks about the British. For me, Tansy is also born in a fire on Jamaica, presently Jamaica, Jamaican systems, school education system, our systems of agriculture. Tansy is actually probably even more than, she's saying, yeah, the British are savage, that's just them. But she's probably even more, because she speaks intimately about very specific places in Jamaica that still exist, right? That like, you know, she makes sure call out Papi in Plantation. She's saying to us that Papi Market is still there today. It was there in her time in the 1700s. So I think she, for me, is the character that brought it into the 21st century. Um, she's the one that says in, in, in the work that I do, she's the one that says, hey, why you think them call this council? It's because the world ending. For me, that's her alluding to climate change, right? She does it very subtly in places, alludes to climate change happening. Mm -hmm. And I say, yeah. But, and, and Tansy, um, very specifically, uh, I've made her day, I can't remember the exact date, but Tansy is born in the period of time that IPC, and it's funny it happened because I didn't actually know this until this August. But um, Tansy is born in the, the, the decade that the IPCC, Intergovernmental Parliament on Climate Change, has said is the beginning of our uh, ecological crisis, right? Mm -hmm. She's born in that time. So she's, and, and she was already speaking to it before I even knew that fact, speaking to the point that, yeah, look, we left it, our kids, our, our children, us, we who are in this chat today, and, and even younger than us, the, the youths who are fighting for the environment, she's saying, look what we, let, look what we did to them. Right, so for me, Tansy is the one who is very much uh, me, and also because she rude, right? Tansy can say things that I possibly cannot say to authority nowadays, right? So Tansy rude, so she's the one that you're going to cut a little bit, you're going to say some bad words, and she does it, and then turns to the per the the character who convenes the session and says, "Sorry, um, you know, sorry, but you're just a man. You're just the, the man who the queen one is the, when the queen tell me to stop, I will stop, mm -hmm. right?" So it, in so many ways, she's reclaiming like womanism and environmentalism, and and I I just love her. You know, I think she's the one that 
started it for me. And then I could I could figure out everybody else once I had her. And um, yeah, and, uh, honestly, I think I will probably write more testimonies from her point of view. Or I from she mentions a family. Yeah, she mentions a family of, of a bush workers. Maybe they mm-hmm. will come from that that strand for their, you know, they, they they work and live with her. I mean, I think this is a great point to to launch into what our bios and bookmarks family knows very well as our promptly written segment. And this is a chance where we really get to see the writers dream big and reach for the stars with their their creative ambition. So for those of you who are new to the segment, here is how it works. The writer, in this case, Zakia, is entering an elevator. As she gets in and the doors close behind her, she sees in the elevator the publisher and editor of her dreams. Now they're in there and they're already having a conversation by the time she comes in. Uh, What they're talking about just so happens to be a dream project that Zakia is going to pitch them her number one elevator pitch to for her dream creative project. Now this project can be anything that our heart desires. It doesn't have to be a book, though it can be. It can be a play. I, I think in, in past iterations of this this season and the one before, we've had musicals, feature films, and art installations. So really, Zakia, the, the sky <laughs> or the elevator is the limit. And as you know, we all tailor these prompts specifically to each writer who's our guest on this show. Mm -hmm. And nothing seemed more appropriate for Zakia's promptly written than lines that I think almost all of us will know. Zakia's promptly written is, if you are the big tree, (laughs) we are the small axe. Zakia, take it away and let us have your promptly written. I think I'm going to take it very literally, okay? I am pitching to these guys that, look, we need a farm. We need some kind of green space <laughs> with where we have trees. And I'm going to go very specific with the trees being the mm-hmm. Lignum Vitae tree, which is, uh, you know, the uh, national tree, no, flower mm-hmm. of Jamaica, national tree of the Bahamas. Very specifically going with that one because um, we know the trees like the mahogany, the ebony. We know the kind of pretty, pretty ones that were used for uh, it's the stately homes, you know, so like the homes that uh, Dr. Karen Fowler has written about. We don't hear so much about the lignum vitae, which was the tree that was uh, put to work, right? It was mm-hmm. the tree that was put to work because it's the heaviest wood in the world, I think, and it did not sink, so it was used to make lots of parts of the slave ship, um, and it was uh, ballast wood. It was, it was used for so many things. I think they were using it for submarines at one time, so I think even now it's on like NASA planes, so it's a working is a working wood, wood that works. So I want to be gentle with lignum vitae. And in one of my stories, I write him as a kind of a, a man and he's dead and somebody's uh, eulogizing him. And so I want to write him as a soft, gentle person. And I want to give him or give lignum vitae its love. So I am proposing that we make a forest or a farm that people can come to, come visit, come learn how to work with, or learn how to grow their food or something. But I don't know if we're going to plant the trees or if we're going to name it after Lignum or we're going to teach people the history through it. Or is it going to be a dance the way make? Or is it going to be through the food? But we're going to, again, give Lignum the, let Lignum be a main character in this space. But it's a physical space where people have to come and come get dirty to come and walk barefoot and stuff like that. I love this. I already want to go. So if for any any rich funders are looking at this episode, we, we need this we need this space right now. And you have in fact written a very beautiful elegy for the Lignum Vitae that I think appears in the anthology The Wild Isles, if I'm not mistaken. It does. Which um yeah. and it, it's you know precisely what you are talking about. Why? Why is this plant tree so overlooked? And it has worked so hard for us and for people who mm-hmm. are not us as well. So in fact, everyone who's looking on should know that Zakia's publication credits as a nature writer are impressive and extensive and growing all the time. And if you want to know where the actual pulse of nature writing is, you need to read her and you need to read her mm-hmm. contemporaries. Zakia, I think this is mm-hmm. a good place if you want to shout out anyone whose work you think yeah. is in, in affinity with yours, in spirit and in conversation. I know we've spoken about Jason, but is there anyone mm-hmm. else you feel is keeping good company with you. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, JC Nyala has a book here in the UK coming out in the next year. And she works with allotments, so growing food. And I can't wait to see that again. Um, so people, I'm, I'm very much interested in the work of people who are, who grew up in, in England as well. So we mm -hmm. get that from, um, I'm thinking of oh, I cannot, uh, Nyala Arbon as well, who actually just was shortlisted for the Nan Shepherd Prize, which is a prize for uh, diverse writers. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. And I must also mention the work of a group called Landing Our Names. So it's not necessarily fiction all the time, but Landing Our Names writes uh, poignantly about the history of uh, British land and how it is used. Um, on the other side, in the Caribbean, who am I reading? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's Kai Miller. And, um, you know, I think he writes really well about land so in a way that it becomes a character. So, mm -hmm. And and also, oh my goodness, I cannot say, I, I said, I, I believe we should all read Gardening in the Tropics by Olive Steen. Yeah, I think we should all read it. We should all read Gardening in the Tropics um, as well. I think so. Gardening in the Tropics is that kind of book that, unfortunately, I think because of the way that many students have suffered through it, they, they are deprived of the yeah. richness and yeah, the yeah. history yeah. and the magic of it. So if there is a way for us to help bring that incredible work to life I'm, mm -hmm. I'm all for it i'm, I'm welcoming mm -hmm. pitches and yeah. you know zakia it's been such a pleasure to talk to you i also can't let you escape without needing to know we have testimonies volume one mm -hmm. what can we hope for <laughs> and, and look out for in volumes two three four okay ten. So, no both <laughs> well i mean honestly i think it's a concept that can go all around the caribbean so you know if if, if there are more volumes, I would love for them to be on other parts of the Caribbean, uh, more than two and three, but two and three will come. Uh, I've spoken to Rough Trade Books about it recently, so, you know, I'm not starting it just yet, but the ideas are definitely peppering in my brain, and the, the characters are coming down, the notes are coming, and we will get that indigenous character. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll get a kind of character from Jamaica. I think we'll probably hear from a similar character who gives the elegy for lignum vitae. So we'll probably hear from a white person in one of these testimonies as well, mm -hmm. um, given, you know, their, given their part of the story. Um, but more, I suppose more sooner than that is I am um, uh, producing some of the story as an audio project. So, uh, you know, it will come to life uh, by January and that will be here in the UK it will be uh, an exhibition at Studio Voltaire. But don't worry because it will be online for all of my people outside of, it, of, of England as well or who can make it down to London to, to see when it when the exhibition. Um, but, but nice things, I'm, I'm writing, oh my gosh, I'm writing poetry and I, I don't find myself, to, you know, I, I I, I feel in comparison to people like yourself, like I don't actually think I'm that good of a poet, but I am, I'm working on like, that's where I'm actually working to kind of develop myself as a writer, as a, you know, the craft. Is to, to that's very that exciting. Writer. I can't wait to hear some of the poems. Hopefully we will be on the same side of the Atlantic when that happens. Yes. There's a beautiful comment from our mutual friend, Marta Fernandez Campo, who says, mm -hmm. thanks, Akia and Shivani, for this great conversation. Love the readings and your pamphlet, Zakia. You write memory and nature as so powerfully connected. Wow. Also love your piece on Lignum Vitae. Looking forward to more. Marta, I completely yes. agree with you. I and I must tell Marta, thank you, sorry, because Marta is who the the wonderful last chapter, she's who looked over my Spanish to make sure it was on point. So thank you, Marta. That is beautiful. Everyone who's tuned in, thank you so much for being here. Zakia, thank you for being here and making thank this episode so of Bios and Bookmarks powered by the NGC Bocas Lit Fest truly special. It's been a real honor and a privilege to speak with you in this way. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So if you enjoy what we do with the Bocas Lit Fest, please, everyone, do consider checking out Friends of Bocas Lit Fest to support our ongoing and future projects. You'll see more information about Friends shortly before the end credits. We'll be back for our penultimate episode of Bios and Bookmarks with Miriam Chansey next Sunday. Until then, stay safe and take care, everyone.
Thank you.